Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 395. The biggest risk of estrogen replacement is uterine bleeding. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Women who've gone through menopause and still have a uterus experience the loss of the hormone estrogen and testosterone. Mm -hmm. And they come to you to get those things replaced which has, there are a lot of reasons for doing that. There are a lot of benefits for doing that. But there are sometimes some side effects that women get upset about uh, if it happens to them. And, and recently so. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if you think you're finished with all of this in your life. The best thing about menopause is not bleeding. <laughs> yes, I've heard that. Uh, and so you think you're all finished with that, and you come in and you get estrogen replacement, testosterone replacement, and you, it's supposed to bring all these benefits to your life, mm -hmm. quality of life. And then all of a sudden you're bleeding again. It's like... You get terrified. You get scared. Does that mean I have cancer? A am I dying? Uh, it has this created some problem that I wasn't expecting? Oh, my God, I can't. And, and so they will sometimes go to their regular physician, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and their regular physician will say, your numbers are too damn high. You need to quit that hormone replacement stuff. Or I don't believe in hormone replacement. Or I don't Stop estrogen. That. Yeah. And, I mean, we always put people who have a uterus on progesterone with their estrogen and and – and so this is bleeding for patients who are already on the prescribed treatment for bleeding. Okay. So okay. The, but the estrogen you give is in a pellet. Yes. The progesterone doesn't go in the pellet. Right. Because I can't find a progesterone that will last four months. And I need it to last the same amount of time as the estrogen and the same amount of time as the testosterone so I can do a pellet every four months. So, 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 but we're talking about women who've gone through menopause mm -hmm. who still have a uterus. Who still have a uterus. They haven't had a hysterectomy. No. They still have a uterus. And so we give them nightly progesterone. Okay. And it's For, a, a pill they a, put under their tongue? It's actually a pill. It's not sublingual. We found one pharmacy, Belmar Pharmacy in Colorado, makes an actual pill that has a covering that allows you to absorbed through your lymph system and not directly through your liver. So it doesn't change it. We want pure progesterone. Okay. So we have our patients take those at night. It helps them relax. It helps them go to sleep. And it opposes the estrogen we give them. Estrogen makes the lining of the uterus thick. And it was meant to make it thick so that an egg or an embryo could burrow into it and, and, and start a pregnancy. But... Basically, when you're young and healthy, you have thickening lining in the first half of your cycle, and the second half, progesterone comes in and compacts it, makes it makes it less thick and more stable until your body finds out whether you're pregnant or not. Right. If there's no pregnancy hormone, then both of those two hormones drop and you bleed. Okay, so that's what's supposed to happen when we're young. When we're older, what we want to do is not bleed anymore. So, so, so the bleeding is, is basically the lining that's been built up in preparation for pregnancy. Right. And it flushes itself out of the system if there's no pregnancy. Right. When both of those two hormones drop right. Right. because there's no pregnancy hormone to it's stimulate them. It's an amazing them. system. I know. It is. It's, it's it, it miraculous. Really, yeah. But you don't need to have a period just because you're, you're on estrogen and you're not going to get pregnant after menopause. So right. a lot of people ask us that. So when we give you estrogen, it thickens the lining a little bit, not as much as when you were making it yourself. And we give you progesterone at the same time to stabilize it. So in the best world where you're absorbing your progesterone every night, you're taking it every night, it's, it's going to balance out so you don't bleed. So you keep saying every night. What happens if you go to a party, you have too much to drink, you pass out, you don't take it tonight? Uh, or you go on vacation and you took if your you pills and it, you only had three days worth and you're you gone only five take, days. If you miss two days, yeah. you're going to bleed. And so that's 
That's normal. But they should know that. If right. you're mm-hmm. not non-compliant in this situation, it, but if well, you're not taking it every night, if you miss a night mm-hmm. or two, for whatever reason. Two nights usually, then you're going to bleed. And okay. so, But when you start the progesterone again, it won't be heavy, but when you start the progesterone again, then it will stop bleeding. That's what's supposed to happen, and I can't guarantee that that happens with everybody, but that's ideally what we're trying to uh, accomplish. So... Progesterone protects the uterine lining from bleeding, but also protects it from uterine cancer. Okay. It doesn't protect you from polyps, doesn't protect you from fibroids. So you can have a uterus that is sitting there and it starts making fibroids or it starts making a polyp that does not respond normally to progesterone and they bleed. So you could bleed because you don't have enough progesterone. You could bleed because your estrogen dose is too high. You could bleed because you have a fibroid developing and it bleeds or a polyp developing and it bleeds. So how am I going to know? Good question. So first we try to balance the progesterone. We try to, that's our first step. That's our first protocol is we try to increase the progesterone and make sure you take it every night and see if that stops the bleeding. So so mathematically, this is like the highest percentage response? Yeah. Okay. So... Mathematically, this is the easiest thing to do and the highest response. Okay. So that's how we choose the sure. order that we do this. So we say double your progesterone for you know the next five or seven days, then decrease it to the regular dose. They shouldn't bleed at that point again, but it should stop the bleeding. And if it does, that means you don't have a fibroid and you don't have a polyp because they don't polyps don't listen to progesterone. They just bleed all the time. Are we talking about volume? Is this like trace experiences or heavy flow experience? I mean, oh, you mean bleeding? Yes. Oh well, some people bleed heavy because they've people who have it's had really a, thick. A, well, people who've had a lot of kids have a spongy uterus, and sometimes the minute the lining starts bleeding, the uterus is kind of leaky, and so it starts bleeding heavily too. Okay. It, there's so many different factors yeah. that could happen, but we start with progesterone. Most people stop there. Then if they don't stop, then we send them for an ultrasound. And so we have some friendly OBGYNs that have their uterine ultrasound and they do, and they're right across the street and they, they do a vaginal ultrasound to look to see why you're bleeding. Yeah. Is it, did you have a thickened lining? Usually we do an ultrasound before you even start hormones, but some women don't get it or they should, but we want to know where we start. But any time in your in your treatment, we want to know what's in there. Is it thickened? Yeah. If it's thickened, then you need a biopsy. Do you have a polyp? Well, sometimes they can't tell if it's thickened or they or you have a polyp, but the polyp needs to come out because it's just going to keep bleeding, or it could be something bad, so it needs to be removed. Something then, bad like cancer, like cancer or precancer. Okay. Then uh, the fibroids generally aren't, um, but. The, so we don't really worry about them as much. But but we want to see what the lining of the uterus shows. Now, because all I do is hormones, I, I used to do all those procedures. I don't now. Right. So I send them to their gynecologist for those procedures to make sure everything's okay. Mm-hmm. Now, having said that, no matter what estrogen they took, if their gynecologist gave them a pill or a patch or anything, if, if you bleed on pellets, you're probably going to bleed, you're probably going to bleed on any estrogen. So if you need estrogen for your symptoms and you bleed on pellets, no matter what you take, you're probably going to bleed if you take estrogen. So in anticipation of that, do you tell a woman you're going to have a normal period? You're going to tell her you you may bleed for two or three days? I mean, what what should she expect? In what what circumstance? Just to know, to be able to anticipate. I don't know. So you don't get scared, you don't get upset. Oh, my God, I'm bleeding. They should stop. Like the first step is the progesterone. They should stop or they should spot and stop. But if they don't stop, then we do the ultrasound. Okay. If the ultrasound is positive, there's something there, then they need to have a procedure, either a biopsy of the lining to see if it's normal or a DNC. And are those doctor's office procedures or do they have to go to a surgery center? A or DNC hospital? is a surgery center. Okay. But a biopsy is just a little, it's a little skinny little tube that you just suction out some tissue and send it. So if you get a DNC, is that a forever solution or will that come back? It can come back. If you have a DNC, then we're cleaning out. It's kind of like if you had a cantaloupe 
you had a hole in the cantaloupe, you put a you put a spoon in and you took out all the seeds. That's a DNC. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's a, done a lot by feel. We have a hysteroscope so we can look inside the cantaloupe first to make sure it's not a polyp or a fibroid or something else. But then we use a suction or we use a curette to to take out all the lining. Then you start over. Then we usually decrease the dose of estrogen, increase the dose of progesterone, and start over on a on a t- is it t- tabula rosa or tabula blank tablet? Blank tablet. Yeah. Yeah. So we start over on that, and then that's great. Or we ask the doctor if they'll ablate the lining, which is burn the lining out at the time of the DNC. Now that works most of the time to keep people from bleeding or making another polyp. Not for, always for fibroids, but it seals the lining so it doesn't collect. It doesn't so, thicken So that anymore. could be a forever solution. That could be. Or some patients we, we, who are more amenable to it, we'll, we'll ask them to put in a Mirena IUD, not for birth control, but because there's a little progesterone package on there that lasts five years. And so if they, if so after you don't have the to DNC, take the nightly tablet. Right. You could just have localized progesterone. It's really just for the lining of the uterus to protect it. So the Mirena IUD is inserted in into the uterus and it stays there and it stays there for, for like five, five years, years and there's a little tail on it and it can be pulled out in five years and put in in the office okay like through a straw kind of thing huh. so i mean to me in in europe when they because pellets are are generally used they put a morena iud in it was there before we had it they put them in they put the pellets in and they put the morena iud in but, you know, like at the same visit. And then wow. it stays at the first visit. And then it stays in, no bleeding, no problems. Because that progesterone keeps the lining really thin. No matter what you do with the estrogen, the, the lining is very thin. And, and it's right, the progesterone is right next to the lining. Mm-hmm. So it's very effective. And, and you, can't, you don't have to take the progesterone at night. So that also works for people who can't tolerate progesterone. It makes them sick or it makes them tired or they can't wake up in the morning. So... You don't do this now because you don't practice gynecological medicine right. now. But you send it to a doctor that right. will do it. Mm-hmm. And and in those cases, is that covered by insurance generally? It is for birth control. I don't know if it's covered. It should be to control bleeding because they're going to prevent a DNC. So it just be a question to ask the gynecologist mm-hmm. you go to. Right. So what if my wife goes to a gynecologist who's not theoretically receptive to any of this stuff that, that you recommend. Yeah, I've had a lot of gynecologists, or not a lot, I've had one group of gynecologists who called me and said, I'm not taking care of, 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 of your, your problems. <laughs> and I'm like... Like you created this monster? Yeah, well, yeah. had they done what they yeah. usually do or should have done, which is give the patient estrogen, they would have been taking care of it anyway. Right. They just would, but, but so we send them to people who will happily... Take care so of you our have patients. a list of physicians mm-hmm. that understand and respect the way you practice medicine mm-hmm. and support that as as good medicine, mm-hmm. and they then will take these these complaints of bleeding mm-hmm. or polyps mm-hmm. or what have you, deal with it on their end, mm-hmm. and then not scare the patient yeah. or challenge the patient in terms of coming back for more hormone therapy. Right, but you know. This is the same protocol that I used when I was a gynecologist and did all this. I'd give somebody estrogen and progesterone, and then they'd bleed, and then we'd double the progesterone, and then all of these steps. Yeah, you're always balancing these wheels. All of these steps are the same as what I did, but I'm now using the pellets, and I don't have time to do the other stuff. Right. So everybody has their own gynecologist. I don't take the patient away from their gynecologist. No. I just, but I do need them to do yearly checks and to do this. But you have had the experience of different physicians who are opposed to hormone replacement being very critical, frightening the patients, frustrating the patients. The patients will call you and say, they told me this. You told me that. Right. How do I know? They're both doctors. That's true. So one of the responses that you sort of in self-protection have done Mm -hmm. is, Find a group of doctors Mm -hmm. that do agree with your Mm -hmm. approach to this, and you'll be happy to give people their names should should they get into it. For those of us who are laymen, 
it's really difficult when we encounter doctors who don't agree. And then they look at us and say, well, I'm telling you, you're gonna, she's going to kill you, uh, but I'm not. I'm not, but you're going to be wish you. But you're going to be miserable. You're going to wish you were dead because you don't have any hormones. Yeah. <laughs> so you, know, you get caught in the middle and you don't know what to do, and you, so you call your insurance company or you call your company at either. work, and nobody knows, and it just it gets nasty. So we have a lot of research papers that we have online, a yes. lot of abstracts that you can read. I mean, you have to be able to read medical, medical journals, but I'm not. Sh- but in general, the tide has turned already that women should be getting estrogen to protect them from heart disease. I mean, there was just an article in JAMA or the or um, Metabolism and Endocrinology this past month that said estrogen protects you and lowers your cholesterol and makes your vessels clean. And yeah. I mean... What about breast cancer? That's pretty good. It doesn't cause breast cancer. And that's what everybody says because yeah. it's old information. Right. It doesn't cause breast cancer. We don't give it after you've developed breast cancer if you have estrogen receptors because... The cells change. In other words, you have normal breast cells. Yes, they're responsive to estrogen, but it's not going to change them into cancer. Basically, it it just does its job with the breast. It keeps your breasts perky, I guess, is what you could say. And uh, but estrogen could feed a cancer that cell the cells change. They become abnormal, and it could feed that particular cancer. In that case, we don't give estrogen. Because we don't want to stimulate anything. Right, any cancer cells. Right. Any cancer cells. So that's what, that's why everybody's scared of estrogen. However, let's go back to bleeding. Yes. In some circumstances, when we do the end, we, when the gynecologist does the biopsy of the uterus, for unknown reasons, that patient may have a cancerous lesion. That's why it's important to do the biopsy. Any postmenopausal bleeding that doesn't stop with progesterone and has a thick lining on ultrasound should be biopsy. So a lesion is a tear or a rip? No. A lesion is abnormal cells. Okay. So it just, the, the lining of the uterus is just as you would imagine if you've ever had a period. I'm not sure men are listening to this. But, it's, it's, but it can be, it, the cells that are too small to see change. And they can get, they can grow and get thick, we, we need to make sure that that's not there. Right. So we do probably 25 biopsies for every one that has any kind of precancer or cancer, cancer in it. But the treatment for our cancer of the uterus is the easiest treatment known to man. It's a hysterectomy. So <laughs> a, an organ that we have already used that we don't that have to with. have, yeah. then we have to have the uterus removed. So we also need our friendly gynecologist to do that too, or the cancer specialist that does it. But that's curative. Right. I mean, it's it's so rare that I can't remember one that wasn't curative. So at the end of the day, then the the culmination of all this discussion is a hormone replacement specialist needs to have connection with regular gynecologists who will take care of these very predictable, normally expected problems that occur, in part be- because they, they, they may not absorb the progesterone the way that right. we need them to, in part because they may not be consistent in taking the progesterone the mm-hmm. way that we need them to. I mean, they, they contribute to the reality themselves, but sometimes the reality happens because of other issues. So you need that balancing of both kinds of doctors. Mm-hmm. And you also, I mean, it's it's helpful to have a doctor who understands that I'm doing their job of hormone replacement. Right. They don't have to do that anymore. Right. They don't have to take the phone calls for that. Or they hormone don't have, management. Or horm- hormone management. Yeah. All they have to do is do what they would normally do if they were doing the hormone replacement. Right. But the, those doctors that put, that put their head under the sand and say, I don't do hormone replacement and I don't take care of people who, 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 do. who have it. Those people you need to flee from. Yeah. They you need to run because those guys are so out of out of touch with reality and gals, I guess, that they haven't read a, a journal in ten years. So they need you need to find a doctor who is willing to work with your hormone specialist or give you hormones and take care of any issues that you might have. And by the way, you can still get uterine cancer if you've never taken estrogen. 
And by on the that way, happy note. <laughs> no, I mean it's just. I mean it's not. Yeah, it's not. Co- it's, it's not, not just connected to, to that. Hormone it is. Replacement. It is connected to estrogen, but it's your own. You can make your own right. estrogen. Right. You can make estrone. I mean, you get a lot more surveillance with us. Yeah. We're looking at your uterus. We're te- testing. We're making sure that you don't have anything wrong. And we're making sure you're getting your mammogram and you're seeing your gynecologist every year. Our patients, if anything's wrong, they find it early. Right. Which so, is always best. Which is always best. So, so that's, I just want to make sure that no one is afraid to take hormones because they're afraid of cancer, which is so rare. As always, thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.